What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Today, the third weekend of the month, which is a little bit different than we normally do, is actually Patrons Picks. So this was voted by the patrons. They wanted to hear about Adam K6 ARK's wild VHF, UHF, really yaggy antennas that are portable, ultra light, and effective. And so that's who we're going to be talking to today. K6 ARK is going to be walking us through his designs, what he's done in the past, and what he has going right now that will help you be more effective when you go portable with VHF, particularly VHF, but also UHF. Enjoy the memes. We'll get started real soon. it going everybody hey thanks for coming out to the hammer crash course really do appreciate you taking the time i know you got a lot of things you could be doing on a saturday and the fact you're hanging out watching me whatever you're doing really cool i do appreciate it today there is so much that i gotta hit before we bring adam on crazy amount of stuff going on uh first and foremost go check out ham tactical tactical.com thank you for the support check out our merch store that leia runs your best ideas to turn into ham radio memes on a shirt i've got to abree for instance, one of my favorites. Anyway, so that's the first thing. Second thing, the 300,000 subscriber giveaway. We are still taking your signups for that. What are we giving away? A Yaesu FTDX10, an ICOM 705, a MobiLinked TNC3, a PowerFilm Solar, at least one PowerFilm Solar panel, um, and probably some other things along the way that, yes, um, I paid for all this stuff this is all me saying thank you except for power Foam. they were so gracious to send us some uh some some things to give away so so thank you power Foam. And, and always love to icom love to yesu uh, thank you for all the support you guys have given in the past as well but anyway that's it just want to say thank you for all that okay there will be a secret word this episode will have a new secret word that's not to say you can't use the one from last week we're not going to be that hard about it but we do we are taking some metrics from this it's really just me because I like to geek out on uh, on numbers and whatnot hey thank you JF for the super chat the 499 super chat it's a one with something blowing up there I was oh it's a balloon I see doesn't doesn't translate well in the stream but thank you very much in the YouTube chat now the next thing and this is just insane okay don't it says out of stock it's not out of stock. HRO, HRO reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing something kind of wild. And I was like, all right, what, tell me about it. What's going on? Like, well, we, we've, got, uh, we've got access to a lot of ICOM repeaters that we're going to sell at insane prices. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Tell me more. And they're like, well, we're, we're taking the, uh, the HRC, sorry, the HRC, the ICOM 70 centimeter and two meter repeater. They also had a 1.2 gigahertz repeater, but they sold out. They're gone. Totally gone. They got a bunch of them coming in from ICOM, and they want to just pre-sell them and get them off the books. This is literally like Crazy Dave's get them off the books, uh, get them off, got to clear all the inventory. A $1650, $100 repeater, 70 centimeter or 2 meter, they have both, available right now for $500. For right now... Till midnight, tonight, that's it. That's all this is good for. Uh, I have links in the description. Whether you want a two meter or a seventy centimeter repeater, these will do analog as well. They're not just D Star. You don't have to be a D Star operator to use these. And typical of Icom fashion, they're nice repeaters. They're easy to use. They've got a, you know, a, an intuitive design to them for for ease of use. Anyway, uh, highly highly recommended if you have like a club and you're looking to get a repeater or maybe have a backup to a repeater in case one goes down, this is like an easy backup, a hot swappable spare, you know, whatever. So this is the two meter one. Again, ignore the out of stock. I, I just got confirmation they are, they are, they're shipping to HRO and then they're gonna be distributed. So you need to buy it now so you're in, you lock in at this price because it's gonna go back up to 1650 and it's done. And then they also have the, uh, the 70 centimeter. So there you go. That's the most insane insane deal i've ever seen period on a repeater so absolutely amazing there you go there's the hot deal link is in the description check that out not an affiliate of mine 
I'm, I'm not making a, a cent out of this. They just said, hey, do you want to do something kind of cool and just announce it on your stream? And I said, heck yeah. So there is a special link that does, you know, let people know you came from me, but I'm not getting it from you. All right, here we go. I want you to go check out K6ARK. I'm going to drop the link. K6ARK.com is where we're going to be talking, not just while we're talking to Adam, but we're going to be pointing to that as well because there's some really fun stuff that we're going to be talking about. But uh, just, you know, the guy that does the, the cool Amazon kits, you know, that you get those antenna kits. Adam, you know him. We love him. Let's bring him on. Let's have a little bit of fun talking about VHF, UHF, highly portable antennas. Adam, how's it going, man? It's going well. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Looks like you're we're lagging a bit. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I know you're you're in the uh, the outskirts of the San Diego area, so your your signal can go up and down a little bit. But you sound great. You're coming in loud and clear. So how you been? What have you been up to? Uh, I've been doing well. Um, I had a really amazing soda activation two weeks ago, and I'll. Uh, if you want to enable sh screen sharing, I'll show you a picture of that. I'll need that in a bit anyway. I and um, it, two weeks ago was the transatlantic summit to summit party for summits on the air. So the goal oh. was to make as many transatlantic contacts as possible. And I went out to a summit in Anza Borrego, and it's just a one pointer. It's about a mile and a half in. And to make a long story short, I went out Friday evening and finished up about 9.30 or 10 a.m. Saturday morning. Uh -huh. And I made 170 total contacts. 113 were DX. Look at this, guys. 26 different, 26 different countries worked. I made 87 total European contacts with 18 of those summit to summit. <sighs> and then uh, six additional U.S. summit to summit. That so it was just, insane. it was insane. I like I can't how many a hundred and what? How how many? How many hundred and eighty? Hundred and seventy contacts. Hundred and thirteen were DX. And how long were you operating? So I operated Friday evening for probably about two to three hours work in Japan, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Indonesia, and then about three hours in the morning and uh you know mostly work in europe and the u.s and i was on 10 and 15 meters only wow. and you remember that crazy antenna that i had I, out I at the do. camp out i do that that was the beast so uh, hopefully you can see the image there it's the one on the left it's a seven element portable wire yagi with about a 35 foot boom length wow. and uh it performed so, uh, yeah, no, no question on yeah. that. Holy smoke. So what was uh, so the 10 meters on the left? That's the one I've seen. And you said you were on 15 as well. How'd you do 15? Is that the one on the right? Yeah. So the one on the right is a 15 meter Moxon. It's a wire Moxon. Oh, so, nice. um, so yeah, absolutely yep. insane. Yeah. Uh, when we did the comparison, when we were, uh, it was the it was the camp out down down in your neck of the woods. And we had I had the buddy hex right. up. And you had your 10 meter up. And although I had multiple bands, when we were on 10 meters, you were killing it because we had the same station in New Zealand we were talking back and forth to. And you got like a three, it was possibly three S units higher, I think, uh, on signal strength just from that antenna. It's like your antenna is a beast, absolute beast. It, yeah, it, it works well. It's, um, it's very fragile. It can't handle the wind or the weather. But, right. um, but when it's calm out, uh, you know, the right conditions, it, it, it certainly seems to perform. So. There's, this, there's this concept but of that's like not Dungeons the... and Dragons. <laughs> it's called uh, the glass cannon. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the glass cannon before? No, I'm not familiar so, with that one. Like a dungeon and drag, like a wizard, you know, a wizard can throw these massive fireballs and does like absolute, like massive amounts of damage. The problem is they can't take much damage. So a, a glass cannon is really good at being a cannon, but if it takes any bit of, you know, whatever, it explodes. And so, like, yeah, I could see that with your 10 meters. It, there's a lot of moving parts yeah. to it. There's a lot of bits. Yeah. It, it, it's designed for lightweight, uh, not for uh, structural stability, we'll say. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, along that path, so you this th that is your big version of ultra portable, ultra effective Yagi antenna. You've also made scaled down versions of ultra portable and effective antennas. My most recent one that I think a lot of people uh, that watch my channel and also yours saw was when we went to San Clemente. You had this fantastic 
air that's it this aero shaft and carbon fiber uh vhf antenna that you were doing satellite work with i think i watched you activate like three satellites with that thing on field day um not to mention the other Yagi you built that you were running uh, Simplex Contacts with. You were absolutely killing it out there, right? But you've been doing these kind of ultra-portable, very effective antennas for a while. And, and everybody on my Patreon said, oh, we got to have Adam come on to explain his thought process. So, yeah, please take it away. Tell us, t Share with us your knowledge, oh, antenna wizard. <laughs> Awesome. Well, so you talked about a few different designs that I've got. Uh, another one, one of the first Aeroshaft Yagis that I built was this one. This is a three element dual band model. It's um, it's got no reflector element and that allowed me to Just get wait, it to wait for work the on internets to catch up. Uh, yes, <laughs> it uh, well, hopefully it'll it'll get there anyway. Um, so th this is the the one you've there it goes you've probably seen in my some of my videos um two meter 70 centimeter no reflector uh yep. which allows it to be resonant on 70 as well and it gets about 5 db a forward dbd a forward gain on both bands so i've used this for satellites it works pretty well um and i wanted to to come up with a design that was kind of similar to that so ultra portable but um with a faster setup so the way yes. that one works you end up having to um you have to screw the each of the four elements onto the boom on a threaded you know rod just like the arrow antenna same same kind of uh okay. concept of construction with those those threaded inserts mm -hmm. so I've been tinkering with another design, and I'll uh, since my my video isn't doing great here. I'll yeah, I'm share trying to look and see if I can do something screen. on my end. But yeah, if you want to, that that would be fine. If you can share, that might be faster actually. If you yeah, we'll pictures. we'll give it a try. <laughs> and thanks, Jason, for being a member, um, and thank you, Arthur, as well. Appreciate the support. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I see that. Or I can share on my end too. Cool. That the website. Right on. Sounds good. So we'll we'll give this a try. That way I have kind of uh, a little bit of scroll control there. Yep. So I came up with this new design. It's only two elements, uh, but there's some kind of special features about it. With with two elements, you still get over 4 dBd a forward gain, which is uh, pretty significant. You know, that's, uh, that, that's a solid amount of forward gain and a 10 dB front to back ratio. But the big difference with this is how i attached the elements yes. and if i scroll down through let's see i'll drop the um, link in the description think... on the show notes for everybody or the chat yeah, yeah he's showing you how to make another, this guys see that? isn't that cool <laughs> so so this through this link here um you, you can find the build instructions for this thing I'm going to try to go back to video. We'll see how this works because it'd be really nice to show you guys this antenna in the Have flesh. Everyone shut off every internet device in the house quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we're, we're seeing it. We're, things are, so things this are is on it. the screen. Yep. So this is it folded up. And rather than threaded rods on this build, I went with uh, basically like your your tent poles go together. So a yes. shock corded design. So all you do is pull the Velcro off in the middle, flip the elements out into place. See if the video can catch up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's painful. Or the DSL is cooking. <laughs> There you go. It's happening. There you go. So you can kind of see how they just slip. Yeah, they just slip together there, slip into place. So the the full view isn't going to do it, guys. It's 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 his, it's the pushing of the data that he's got on his end. That, that we'll we'll do the best we can. That's why he sent us plans. Yeah. So, so hopefully you're getting kind we of are the, we are yeah. The concept there. Mm -hmm. So you made it so that the, uh, the elements that are, are on a uh, elastic line, a shock cord, and then they kind of just can pop into place. 
and easy to uh, to deploy and stow. That's super, super cool. Nice design for sure. Oh, we lost him. Wait, he's coming back. That's right. Oh, he's got, he's going to share the, the website. <laughs> Trying to share. <laughs> Uh, I was going to share some some images. I've got some pictures here, so we'll we'll see how that goes. That's what I get for living out in the middle of nowhere. No, I, I understand. I, I get it. I get it completely. So, um, so we talked a little bit about the you know the shock cord design, and one of the things that you may have seen in my my previous video about the the three element yagi dual band yagi build was that i i used some nylon bushings that i had to drill some holes in and and there it goes it's sean um yep and use that to attach the elements to the boom this time uh, I came up with a 3D printed bracket that hopefully makes that a little bit easier. And so that's all linked on the the page that that Josh posted earlier, along with the build instructions. So you can you can print that out on your 3D printer uh, and use that to attach your brackets uh, to to the boom. Now. There, there's kind of some funky construction considerations that, that you have to understand with using these arrow shaft elements. And I can go into a little bit of that in the build instructions, but these, these arrow shafts are coated with an anodized coating that's non-conductive. Wow. And when, when you try to use those for antenna elements, uh, it doesn't work so well unless you get in there with some sandpaper and actually remove the anodized coating from those elements. So there's, there's a couple ways you can do that. One easy way for this construction design is to just sand the, with some, you know, 400 or 200 grit sandpaper, just sand the anodized coating off the end of the element that's going to be pressed against that little aluminum fitting on the boom. It's even better if you get the anodized coating out of the interior of the, the element as well to give it a little, you know, a little bit more area to make contact. Mm -hmm. And that's what I use this for. This is just a uh, ro ro high-speed rotary tool, like a Dremel tool. And yeah, that's the disc cutter. One bit. of the attachments. Yeah, that you just. It is, ah, but with a little smart. strip of sandpaper attached to it. So I take that, I stuff that into the end of the the arrow shaft element, and just sand out the anodized coating, and that seems to work pretty well. I like that. Good use of tools there. Yeah, let's see here. I'll see if I can, uh, let me find a f picture of the bracket that I designed. So the the bracket here is just a, a 3D printed design. The The boom goes down through the, the middle of the bracket there. And this allows you to simply use uh, 832 threaded you know, screws that are three quarters of an inch long to attach the um, the threaded inserts that are used on some arrows. Oh, okay. And uh, so they're they're internally threaded. Here's a maybe. Eh, that's not a great photo of it. Let's see here. There we go. That's a little better image of the bracket. There we go. Oh, okay. So um, so yeah, the. This provides a relatively easy way to attach uh, these these threaded inserts and then the arrow shafts to the bracket. So, you know, we talked a little bit about removing the anodized coating from the inside of the arrow shaft to get uh, conductivity there, and um, the other sort of challenge I had to sort out was getting the shock cord fixed into the end of the threaded insert and the the solution that ended up working well for that I, I thought i might have to glue them into place but i found that if i um kind of fray the end of the sheath the outer coating on the shock cord 
and get some of that down into the threads where the screw threads interfere and capture it in there, it gives me uh, a pretty good attachment from the, the threaded insert to the shock cord. Oh, so I okay. didn't end up having to glue uh, any of these at all, and it, it actually worked quite well. Really? Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so all of this is pretty just off-the-shelf kind of easy stuff to get. It it really is. It's it's all uh pretty much from from just from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Uh you can buy the arrow shafts there uh and, and on the 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 link there, the build details, you've got a bill of materials there uh to to find all the stuff that you need to build the antenna. So it's, you know, it's that 3D printed part you need some 832 threaded, uh, three quarter inch long stainless steel screws. Um, ideally some M3 set screws, but you can also get away with uh, some like quarter inch um, 632 screws if you drill the hole out a little bit bigger. That's uh, for securing the bracket to the boom. Okay. You've got the, uh, let's see, I'll, I'm gonna swap the screen that I'm sharing here over to the website. Um, you need some of those arrow shaft threaded inserts and eighth inch shock cord, some foam or other type of grip material, uh, the coax to, uh, to feed the thing. And then the number eight ring terminal to attach the, uh, the, the feed point to the, uh, the elements there. What coax did you go with on this? I went with RG316, okay. and it's nice to also have a small toroid um, with a like an FT50-43 toroid. You can get about four turns of RG316 through it as a choke right near the feed point, or better yet, if you've got a little bit bigger, you know, a, a FT82-43 or something of the sort, you can get, uh, you know, six to eight turns in there for a, a choke near the feed point and that'll that'll help out a little bit very okay and see that yeah you guys can see the dimensions of everything so is that functionally a reflector in the back it is yeah it is. so okay. the front element is the the driven element and that's kind of a key point with designing um a, a yagi the the driven element needs to be the the two elements need to be isolated from each other because they're they're essentially just a dipole mm -hmm. so just like your you know your regular dipole antenna those two uh the wire that goes to the right needs to be connected to the the center conductor and the wire that goes to the left or vice versa connected to the shield so you've got uh you know your your driven element there all the other elements of a yagi need to be electrically connected to each other. So the right side needs to be conductive to the left side. And another, I think, useful point to understand is that the, all of the passive elements, the non-driven elements can also be conductive to the boom mm -hmm. and it doesn't really make any difference. Oh, interesting, okay. So even though they're not in this case, they can be and it's not a problem. Correct. Yep. Okay. So the boom and, is basically you know, the same material as the elements. Correct. Okay. Yeah. The the boom is is just another arrow shaft in this case. So going through the kind of the build process here, I talked a little bit about um, removing the anodized coating. First things first, I I cut the elements, and to to cut, I, I found the best way to cut these uh, these arrow shaft elements is to use a, a pipe or tubing cutter, um, kind of okay. like the one uh, like that will hopefully plumbing. load here. Yes, exactly. The, oh, it's yeah. got a threaded yep. rod on yep. the end. Yep. And you just kind of uh, pinch it and twist the, the, the tube cutter around the, the arrow shaft and it, and it cuts it right off very cleanly and, and very precisely, right? Really where you want it lengthwise because length of the elements is pretty critical in these builds to get the tuning right so these dimensions are all in in millimeters on the uh, the, the page that shows the the dimensions there it goes 
finally loading again. Kind of important so once for you... millimeters in this case because you are needing to get pretty precise with it. It's a little bit easier. I yeah, think. for sure. I, I really think it is, and, th and that's generally what I prefer. But you know, if you if all you've got is a, a an English tape measure or um, you know a a, a, a yardstick. You can always just convert to, to inches yeah. and, and work it out that way. Yeah. All right. Very good. I'm going to take a minute, if you don't mind. I, I'm going to mention the secret word for the live stream. If you got a minute here, Adam, I'll take over. The Do secret it. word is repeater. Obviously repeater because of the uh, crazy sale that uh, HRO is doing. Link is in the description if you'd like to get in on the $500 2 meter or $500 70 centimeter ICOM repeater. Brand new repeater that uh, HRO is selling. They've got a good number of them. So everybody that wants one should be able to get it without any problem. Uh, go take a look at the links in the description. Also, when we wrap up this show, we're going to go over to the Discord and we're going to have a bit of an after chat. So anybody who'd like to join us on the Discord to ask your just relative general ham radio questions, best to do it over there. We're going to be talking mainly about Adam's antenna for the rest of this show. So just keep that in mind. The secret word is repeater. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam, for letting me uh, indulge myself on that one. So, uh, okay. So you, you got the whole bill of materials. Again, link is in the uh, description for this video and in the uh, the live chat. Um, obviously, this is just one of your designs, and you mentioned a couple of the other ones as well. What have you found is, uh, I don't know, in, in your process of building these antennas, like, what have you found is an important tool for, for building or for getting the most out of like working with this kind of stuff? Because it is actually, you should be pretty precise when you're doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, for sure. And um, to, to answer, uh, you know, a, a, a quick question in the, in the chat there um, is the loss in carry weight uh worth the loss in gain over the three element with a you know full size optimized three element yagi you can probably get another uh two db of gain out of it um and and in designing these things you know one of the considerations is that uh kind of diminishing return of adding elements for more gain with with yagi antennas basically every time you double the number of elements you get about 3 dB of gain. So when you go from one to two elements, you know, you get three-ish. In this case, we got a little over four dB of gain. Um, and then when you go from two elements to four elements, you get another three dB of potential gain up to, you know, about six dB of gain with, with four elements. And then you got to jump up to eight elements to get that next three dB of gain. And then up to 16 elements for that next 3 dB of gain. It, it's so, kind of the so same you kind of see how... It's kind of the same concept of doubling your power, right? Do you have to continually get larger and larger doubling? That's kind of almost a similar type of thing with the elements, right? Like right. Throwing it, when you throw an amp behind something. So so that's... that's yeah, so that's that's one of kind of the, the first considerations in in coming up with, with a design. And... You know, next up, you know, uh, deciding what what bands I want to operate on with it. Is it, you know, am I good with a, a mono band or do I need something dual band for the purpose of, say, satellite operations? Mm. Um, and then uh, what are my other priorities with it? Quick setup, extreme portability and lightweight packability, or optimized for as much gain as possible while still being a portable antenna. Mm. So, yeah. so those are all kind of the, the key initial considerations. And then I come up with, you know, the, the design from there. And as you saw in this design, I've, I've kind of concluded that the, the arrow shafts are, are a really good solution to a lot of these problems because they're, they're lightweight, they're sturdy. Um, they're a little slower to set up perhaps than, than some other options, um, but still pretty good with the, the threaded ends. And, um, and even, you know, much better from a, a speed standpoint with these new uh, shock corded, this, this new shock corded type design. Mm -hmm. I like it. 
We got a really good question from G in the uh, in the, uh, the chat here. In step ten, you say check the tuning. How do you adjust if the tuning is off from KC three SMW? Yeah, great question. Um, so if your elements are too short and the resonant frequency is too high, um, it's it's going to be a challenge. Uh, you're you're pretty much going to have to build a new element to replace the ones that are too short. It's always easier to remove uh, material than it is to re-add material. So, um, so measure carefully and cut carefully. And um, I initially cut mine a little bit long, uh, you know, a few millimeters longer than my model said to cut them. And I ended up removing even a little bit more material uh, than had I cut it to the exact length of the model. So the dimensions I put in the instructions are basically my final uh, physical build and match to that. So they should be pretty dang accurate. If you do need to remove some material, what I, the way I did it on mine, I took that tubing cutter, I positioned it near the, the end of the, the element that has just you know the shock cord with one of those threaded fittings and a knot tied in the shock cord to to kind of hold it in place and i just gently pulled it out so it was extended out of the tube mm -hmm. i used the rotary cutter the tube cutter to cut off about two or three millimeters of the tube and then i used uh some wire cutters to just snip that aluminum so i could i could pop it off of the shock cord and ultimately shorten that element now, I know from having cut quite a few number of copper plumbing pieces in my time that uh, sometimes when you try to get real precise, like you're trying to just shave it off, it's almost easier to just sand um, to get to get accuracy because at some point those pipe cutters have like a little ridge on the inside rollers that could get like prevent you from getting super accurate or they start to deform the, the pipe. So I guess try to be as accurate as possible with your first cut and then maybe sand it into position or what did you do for the final like fine tuning um you know i i didn't sand into position i i would recommend sanding the cut end before you assemble things because it does kind of make a rough surface there and making yeah. that smoother is just going to make the assembly a little easier but um uh you know a couple of millimeters um doesn't make a huge difference on a you know um oh, what is this a 400 uh 455 millimeter um uh, element so so you you know you you have a little bit of flexibility there uh -huh. um and uh, you know i, I think you, you're not going to adjust tuning with a sander on this one it, it's you, you need to Probably remove a bit more material uh people are mentioning a file it, and then you got zip wheel grinders uh, really high speed grinders are really like messy to kind of play with a, the end mm -hmm. of a of a pipe that's not usually very effective to do i guess i guess the takeaway here is do the best you can to like be very close to adam's measurements i would say that would be the best recommendation because it Cutting pipe and having to adjust really small bits is like a pain from my experience. Right. Yeah. So, so there's a, uh, I think a slightly humorous question in there. Can a Yagi be 3d printed? And the answer is actually yes. Um, while there are some conductive materials that could potentially be used to print an antenna, what I would do if I wanted to print an antenna would be to print the structure and then use some copper tape or another type of metallic tape as uh, you know as a conductive coating around it and i've played around a little bit with conductive tape as a, a potential way to build an ultralight portable yagi and you know it's kind of another option that might be worth experimenting with for yagi antenna elements i had some I think they're three or four millimeter diameter carbon fiber tubes, which are super light. Yeah. And I just wrapped them with uh, 10 millimeter wide copper tape and made them, uh, you know, conductive elements. The biggest drawback to that I found was that that conductive, that copper tape is actually really fragile. So it's, it's very easy to damage it and not really something that I want to deal with in the field too much. Yeah. 
Uh, so, somebody's just said Sawzall. Don't use a Sawzall. <laughs> that's not, not going to be good. <laughs> that's too rough. Uh, no, I, I agree with the with the little twisty, turny plumber cutter. I just I know from just past experience of banging my head into the wall, literally dealing with plumbing, that it sometimes is a pain in the butt if you need to slightly adjust. Um, so you you've obviously changed this up a little bit because when we talked about doing this video, um. Uh, I was thinking, I remembered, right, your your antenna you brought to San Clemente. And San Clemente, that's where you've got that, you know, the carbon fiber one. A uh, lot more going on there. And there were some things I think you told me, and please repeat them, basically that, that would probably make it more of a difficult project. And what is that? And, and why did you come up with this new design, I guess? Yeah, so um, so th so that one, I, I've got the boom uh, right here. I'll I'll see if I can get it to, to show up. But this this happens to be um, a carbon fiber boom that um, a friend gave me. Uh -huh. And these things are expensive. Oh, and okay. uh, because they're, they're, they're pricey, and then there's uh, just a lot going on on this design. But that said, um, there's some cool, you know, 3D printed parts to this that make it pretty easy. And uh, I did start looking into availability of a similar material for a boom and i do plan on releasing uh, and posting similar build instructions for for this antenna as well mm -hmm. it just does not want to load <laughs> it'll give it a second it's it's pushing to space right now there it is all right there we got it you all of a sudden catch up and then it's... it'll catch up with like multiple <laughs> frames and you're good totally pixelated but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we got yeah, it we got it i, I think also uh <laughs> do you have a video on that one by chance or is there any i, I know you probably got some video of shooting some of the uh, satellite contacts you made on san clemente so if you if you're so interested go check out his uh, youtube channel which uh you can check him out it's it's literally at k6 ARK. if you use that on youtube it'll take you right to him we're now all high tech with them at symbols yeah, I, I do not have a build video of that one yet, um, but I do have a build, well, sort of a build vi video, a video that gives you enough information to build the, the three element dual bander, which is kind of a cool, uh, useful little antenna. And, you know, with, with that um, considered, I want to mention a, a few things about um, building these or assembling these inserts for uh, uh yes. threaded assembly like kind of kind of like the arrow antenna and to do that you need to get these inserts fixed into the ends of the arrow shafts and, and in, the, in this case it's it's critically important to remove that that interior anodized coating before you crimp these into place and what i found is that a standard cable, uh, a coaxial cable crimper with the uh, 255 oh. um, size jaws actually work pretty dang good for crimping these. Yeah, so it's something you probably already have the the 0.255 inch jaws, and um, I use those. Whoops, didn't mean to unshare that. Let's go back. Uh, I use those to crimp them into place, but there's there's actually a little more to it than that. It's not quite that simple because once you crimp those bad boys into place, you typically end up uh, deforming the threads uh, on the interior of the threaded insert enough to where it doesn't no longer easily threads onto <laughs> the, the, the mating screw. So to oh. fix that, um, I pull out an 832 tap, oh stuff it in the gosh. drill, and retap the thread. You're retapping thread. Oh, that's why this process is such a pain. I w I was wondering, like, how difficult can this yeah. be, Adam? This can't be that hard. But yeah, if you crimp it, you're totally going to screw up the threads. Wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. This is all right. Well, I appreciate you showing us this. Yeah. <laughs> and then on top of that, if if I want to use the um, the uh like uh male female threaded uh uh couplers basically for these these sh these arrow shafts um i also end up having to re-drill the counter bore 
uh, that, you know, because it's counterboard about half an inch into the hole before the threads start. So I typically re-drill that as well, so it, it fits together smoothly for, for those. We're getting so, comments. It so says, that's crimp it with a bolt in it, Adam. Have you tried that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, and then you do, then it's just stuck there. And then you never get the bolt out, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, I yeah. see that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, but you're going to have to re-tap it anyway um, because of the, you know, this, the deformation of it all. So, so the, the tap fixes it. Um, so how do these normally work? Well, uh, I, th I don't know how they normally, I think they normally glue them in uh, to these aluminum arrow shafts. The and arrow you can't must. use epoxy unless it's, yeah. Because they don't have crimp you, marks on you, the you arrow elements. Well, I, but you, I don't think, you, you'd have to use a very expensive conductive uh, epoxy to get that to work because it has to be a good electrical connection too. Uh, 100%, so, yeah. Or my, press fit, I guess Jerry uh, Chuck saying, but I don't know. That, yeah, that's, that's that's my guess. So the yeah. the the interior inner diameter of these arrow shafts that are cheaply available is about six and a half millimeters, and the only threaded inserts that you can get are either six millimeter, six point two millimeter, or seven point something millimeter outer diameter. Mm -hmm. None of those fit well enough to just press fit in and i've been unable to find uh you know a good commercial off-the-shelf solution to a threaded insert i do have a lathe and i've thought about you know making my own but <laughs> that also is not something that <laughs> you know right. the, the average builder is going to be able to do yeah that, so, that, but yeah. this is you right oh 100 your so, new design so you, is perfect yeah and, and also I and, guess you could and also this design yeah, this isn't too bad. This is, you know, generally stuff that you're going to have. So just know that that if you do want to build a, you know, a threaded rod version like that, that um, crossed 70 centimeter, um, uh, two meter one that I had at San Clemente for satellite ops, um, th this is how you're going to want to build those elements. Get rid of that anodized coating. Mm -hmm. Make sure you got a good, uh, you know, electrical connection. Crimp it into place, and then uh, retap those threads so it it goes on uh smoothly so how, how did you build your yeah, uh how did you stack the cans for the 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 broomander <laughs> just do that so right? i've got a yeah that that would be pretty hard I've, I've got a wire feed mig welder and i i just kind of very carefully uh tacked those together um and burned through plenty of them too but so that's it in its uh, packed down state. I like that. Is there a potential, a way that you could uh, you could make the cross section smaller or thinner? I guess. The cr um, oh, you mean where the the inserts stick out? Yeah. So how far like, the inserts? Exactly, because yeah. the inserts are wide, and that's causing them the the when they're folded, that's they stick out even further, right? So could you like cut those in half maybe, and would it still work? um you, you kind of need the the shoulder at the base of it mm -hmm. uh for the arrow shaft to rest against mm -hmm. um so you couldn't cut the bottom off you no. might be able to cut a little bit of the top portion off but that's where most of the threads are um so so possibly and and you know some inserts are shorter than these i think the ones that i posted in the bill of materials are actually um, a bit shorter than these so Okay. So it would certainly be possible I, to have I mean, a, a little bit less. This is going to go into most backpacks there. without any problem. So, you know, this is like a non-issue. Yeah, look at that, guys. Look how small that is. And how much did you say it weighs? It's about five ounces. Um, so I think a little under five ounces without the coax on it. That's just amazing. Look at that. Now, um, you mentioned, I think it comes out to about four. 6 dbi i think we were talking about beforehand you mentioned 6 dbi for gain uh this would obviously be more than enough if you wanted to do a summits on the air and you lived in an area with people on simplex this would be able to knock it out you'd have no problem right that oh yeah absolutely i mean you know if you so you you've been recently doing some tests with the the j pole roll up j pole and yes. uh, i know you're also very familiar with the the uh mfj half wave telescopic whip 
so that that'll those will each basically radiate like a dipole so this will give you uh more than 4 db of directional gain over that and it's got about 10 db of front to back ratio so that's good that's i mean that's I actually just did a soda yesterday, and I had to fall back to the old standard of the half wave uh, on the on the VHF radio for for doing simplex local. I still activated it; was fine, but um, it, it's amazing how effective those half waves are. And that's Adam is the reason why you you uh, he got me onto that, and it's it's a fantastic antenna. But this would do even better than that. And to be honest, it's it's not much. It's not very bulky, and I think you get the added benefit of having directionality, which is always nice. Right, and and I think you know I, I would probably end up just strapping this to the the outside of my pack. That's going to be the easiest you know way to carry it. Just yeah. strap it under one of the you know lo kind of loosely under one of the compression straps on the sides, um, and uh, and you know the again kind of the the key goal with this was just to make it as quickly as possible to to deploy um so it's it's almost instant i actually originally came up with with this design with uh elements and a boom uh the the boom had a section in the middle that would fold in half to make it even smaller and then each element uh folded into two pieces as well to, oh so goodness. it would just pack quite a bit smaller you could and, totally do that um, it just takes more work right to be able to yeah, make that all work yeah it, it's yeah, it's more work, a little bit tricky to kind of sort out how to do that, um, but it's it's certainly certainly doable. And my goal with that, uh, I, I was designing that one tuned for search and rescue frequencies, so I could have that handy. And if I, you know, needed just a, a, a bit higher performing antenna, I could easily pull it out of a you know a pocket, deploy it, and and have it set up pretty much instantly. Hmm. Yeah. So obviously this is two meters, and I, all, most of the antennas I've seen you use are, are two meters, but it sounds like you're also looking at some of the higher stuff as well. Have you built anything like this for 70 centimeters? Um, sort of. So, so the, the, the one that I brought to San Clemente Island was, uh, it sure would be nice if the video would work. I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's okay. that one has... Uh, basically a six element 70 centimeter Yagi on one, you know, axis of the boom. Yeah. And I think a four element two meter Yagi on the other axis. So I've, I've built that one for, for 70 centimeters. And then um, I also built uh, a 1.2 gigahertz one. That was the one, that's the one that's in the video thumbnail that I sent you last night. Yeah. So obviously with those ones, I mean, that's a fixed Yagi in that case, right? The elements don't move in that case for 1.2, right? R correct. I, it's just, you know, the whole thing is, I think, six or seven elements, and it's only, what, 16 or 18 inches long. So it's it's pretty small. And yeah. um, so that one is actually a good one to note. Um, another sort of unique characteristic of, of Yagi antennas that you have to consider with with designing and building these and can be a challenge for for some of them yagis typically have a low radiation resistance less than 50 ohms okay. uh, oftentimes between like 12 and 35 ohms for the the feed point impedance on a, a you know well-designed yagi antenna mm -hmm. so you have to figure out how to match that and on that that 1.2 gigahertz antenna i used what's called a gamma match that's the type of match that the arrow antenna uses right and it's got uh basically an adjustable capacitor and then a, a feed point part way out one of the driven elements and with that type of feed you can also have your driven elements uh connected to each other conductive to each other and connected uh, to the boom if you have a conductive boom and that gamma match will still work um, on the five element six meter yagi that i built using arrow shafts and aluminum for the boom um, i used a quarter wavelength of uh, coax um, that was uh, a lower impedance to act as a transformer from the 28-ish ohm feed point impedance up to the 50 ohm coax impedance that I was feeding it with. And that's um, 
you know, quarter wavelength coax match is something you can look up and figure out how to build. That's another really useful way to, to match a Yagi antenna. It's a monoband match. So, you, you know, you're limited to a specific band and, and even a, a, sometimes a smaller frequency range, but they work really well. Uh, yeah, so oftentimes you are going to grab something like this for something like Summits on the Air, right? That's going to be the primary kind of thing you're going to be doing with it. Or what else would you use with this for? That, yeah, that's right. Mostly Summits on the Air. Okay. Um, and, put, you know, like I said, potentially uh, Search and Rescue as well. That could be a, a good application for these two. Yeah. Oh, we got a couple of good questions. So if you at Ham Radio Crash Course or put the word question in your question when you type it out, we'll be able to take it. So uh, this is from BLD. They're asking, what is the wattage rating from your opinion? Um, it, it really is. It, it'll take a lot. You could you could put just about uh, as much as you want into that. Um, the, you know, six plus millimeter, well, seven plus millimeter outer diameter elements. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to guess the RG316 might be your limiting factor for or um, the 3D printed for power handling on, on this design. Yeah, but it, it shouldn't get hot because there's there's going to be pretty, uh, balanced, pretty low yeah. resistance in there. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's a good one. Which is more important for a Yagi, a reflector or a director? <laughs> good question. Well, um, Standard antenna designs uh, typically add a reflector first, and uh, although you know we use the terms reflector and director because it kind of describes what they do, um, they're not actually reflecting or uh, directing anything. They're they're passive elements that that, uh, uh, as I understand it, soak up some of that radiated uh, RF. Um, have uh, because of the the difference in length they have a bit of a phase change that causes it uh that when it re-radiates from that element it causes um you know a constructive or destructive interference in the the radiation pattern mm. in the direction you want it so uh kind of kind of cool stuff but the the standard that you see is that um a director i'm sorry a, a reflector a longer passive element behind the driven element um, gives you more uh, more added gain and more front to back ratio impact uh, when you add that first, and then beyond that, you're going to be adding uh, shorter passive elements in front of the radiator, uh, as we call them directors. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm waiting for my chat to update. Why is it not updating? That's weird. Uh, question: What is a good? Well, so. Uh, uh, this is a topic for probably a, a much broader antenna discussion, but what is a good SWR for this antenna? I, I'm also assuming you, you probably did a, an R and X check. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So, so for, for this antenna, you should be able to pretty much get a one-to-one -one SWR. Yeah. Uh, and with a, a two element Yagi, that's, that's pretty achievable and pretty easy to do without any kind of matching network. This, this has, you know, a 50 ohm impedance at the feed point and was specifically designed for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I didn't want to have to deal with any kind of matching unit or anything complicated like that. So yeah. on mine, I've got one-to-one -one SWR at about uh, 144.5. So it's a little low <laughs> still. And then, uh, at, uh, at national simplex calling frequency 146.52, I think it's about 1 1.4, 1 1.5 to 1. If it's under 2 to 1, I'm happy with it. It's going to perform plenty well. Yeah, everybody, remember what Adam said earlier. This is effectively a dipole with, with, a, with passive components onto it. So monoband dipoles, you can get that SWR super low, but, you know, you're still, there's more to look at than just that. Uh, oh, <laughs> Marvin... There are people that are still trying to solve your your uh, your your implementation <laughs> questions. Question: Did you try freezing the seven millimeter inserts and heating the aero shafts? You will end up with uh, with a interference interference fit. Is that what it's called? An interference fit, or is it just a press fit? Yep, that's what it's called. An yeah, press fit is an interference fit. An interference fit is what it's yep. called. I've never heard that term before. Okay, I'm not a mechanical engineer. Yeah. Adam is. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yep, we uh, we we use uh, interference fit on uh, fasteners on on aircraft to um, to help manage uh, fatigue and and actually improve fatigue life. So kind of an interesting thing. Oh, um, but okay. uh, but yeah, the the inserts the the larger inserts I have are just too big. They even no matter how cold you got the the insert and how hot you got the tube, it just it would it won't go in there. So I could put them on the lathe and I may turn them down. You know. Uh, uh, a few, you know, 15, 20 thousandths and get them to fit that way and yeah. press them in for the next build. But, uh, there's, there's unfortunately nothing I can find commercial off the shelf. That's, that's going to be a nice, perfect interference fit to press in. That's a good point that I, I need to say something <laughs> guys, Adam, uh, redesigned this kit for you, for, for everyone to be able to make this. So the link that I'm posting is to this two element quick yaggy. Adam can do all the things. We already know that about Adam. He can go off and do all these things with the tools he has and the knowledge he has. But if everybody wants to build something like this, this is probably like the everyman Yagi that he's kind of built here for two meters, you know, doing some simplex contact. So that's that's kind of the point. So make sure to avail yourself of that. And by the way, the secret word is repeater. Repeater. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. So... Keep going. Keep going. I, I saw a good question there. I, I think it was from uh, from James, if I remember correctly. Yeah, is it the adding um, the directors but, after the the reflectors? Yeah. Yeah. So so um so I actually have the the model open in MMANA right now, and uh, I I ran it fifty ohms exactly. Um, you know, on on uh, the frequency I've selected, and then I went in and I deleted from the design i didn't change the driven element but i deleted the reflector so what would happen if we ran the model with no reflector and um sure enough i've got uh 63 ohms with a negative 31.1 ohm uh reactive impedance mm -hmm. and a swr of 1.81 to 1. so so no that 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 reflector is actually key to uh, and they interact to to getting that that tuning just right. Yep. So kind of interesting how that works. Which uh, you know, for for many people, if you've ever set up an end fed half wave and it's too close to a metal structure, you get some kind of interaction. It's probably obviously seen in your SWR along with that. So it's kind of the same thing, right? Antenna pieces they will interfere in positive and negative ways, and Adam just happens to be doing it in a positive way as a reflector in this case. Yeah, this right. is cool. Yep. I, I love your design. This is uh this is super fun. I think I, I think I'm gonna try and build this as well. And and see this is the best part, guys, because I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up now. Uh just so I can uh, now I'm gonna drive down here to the most important part. Uh hopefully these are all uh, they look like they are. They're these are all Amazon affiliate links for Adam. So go buy all these bits and build it yourself. This actually looks like it's a uh, Fairly straightforward, and the best part about this is, I think Adam also made the printables bracket. So you just, yeah, he did. I did. Yeah, yeah. so like printed in PETG, I think. He, yeah, he. Uh, what'd you print it in PETG? Yeah, I, yeah. I always recommend PETG or or nylon or ABS. Uh, PLA is Don't not great PLA. for for yeah. stuff like this. That's going to be outdoors. So. ABS might be the best, but PETG will work. Um, but yeah, look, he he's done all the work for you guys to like make this happen. So I'm. I'm really, uh, I'm really liking the, uh, the, the design. And plus, you can just flip it out, and, and you're good to go. That's the, that's the best part of this. So, Adam, I think it's another, again, killer design. You always come up with the coolest stuff. I, I love it. I know everybody else loves it too. So, um, well, thanks. I, I appreciate yeah. it. And, and you know, like, like you said, I, I did specifically design this one for, for this stream. I, I wanted something that was relatively easy to build. Um, but also very functional and effective for yeah. portable operators. And uh, th this, I think, will be kind of the start of, of more pages that I'm going to add for build instructions for some of my other uh, Yagis as well. And, you know, I, I've kind of hacked them together as I build them, but as I, as I build them and build more, I come up with better ways to make them. And... Uh, for example, some of the ones like the the big six element two meter Yagi uh, that uses the C channel aluminum boom, and then the the five element six meter Yagi uses the same type of boom material. 
um, I, I kind of manufactured hinges to, f to make those booms fold out of just aluminum, but I have some really good ideas on how to make 3D printed brackets for that. Mm -hmm. So my, some of the next ones I want to do are some designs for those 3D printed brackets and then uh, to, to share those so, so others can build those antennas because it's, it's pretty cool to have a, you know, a, a 10 plus 10 to 12 DBI six meter Yagi that's backpack portable. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, you got a number of people that are going to go off and build it. <laughs> Ham Radio Rookie says, why not use JB Weld? It's not conductive, but you could connect to the root of the shaft. Or, I mean, yeah, you could, you could, but I don't know if that's, that's just more steps, right? It, it is, yeah. It's, you know, the, the ideal solution is to, to have, uh, you know, the, the, the insert, and, and the threaded portion be the, the conductive piece. Yeah. So another another one, uh, we'll see if the, the picture will load there. Uh, <laughs> I just bought a box of 36-inch uh, welding rod, aluminum welding rod. That's, I think, uh, oh, what are these? 316th or something like that. No, they're smaller than that. Maybe these might even be 332nd. They're about three millimeters in diameter or so. And... I'm trying to figure out how to uh, attach these to each other. So, you know, the, the right half of the element is connected to the left half of the element. Yeah, they're 330 seconds. Thanks, Bill. And, um, and then my goal with these is to build probably a two by two stack of uh, two meter Yagi's so I can attempt to work EME from a soda summit. So we'll we'll see how that goes. EME. Uh, somebody was talking about EME uh, fold out EME kits, and that's literally no joke. He's gonna do it. <laughs> He's gonna do it, guys. Look at him. Oh, that's super cool. Look at that. Um, let's see. Oh, there's so many questions. Okay, what is the maximum number of elements that you could put put on a Yagi? What is the maximum number of uh, elements? As you many so as theor theoretical question. And really as many as you want you, you start to run into to physical construction problems mm -hmm. um, as the boom gets longer and longer and and as i you know i mentioned at the beginning you you gain about 3 db each time you double the number of elements so um you know if if you let's say you want uh uh 18 db you've got uh uh you know six times of of doubling elements so two four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four you're gonna have sixty four elements to get eighteen db of of gain so so typically rather than making yagis longer and longer you start stacking and phase you know phasing them to uh feeding them in phase right uh stacked by about um by about a wavelength to two wavelengths horizontally and vertically and by doing that you can start to build more more gain out of your system without having a you know 200 foot long boom yep plus the the, the gain gets so tight that it'll cut glass that's how tight no, i'm just kidding um all right question <laughs> uh what about pla plus by the way we're not going to talk too much about uh material but yeah pla plus is probably fine it's similar to pet g it's better than pla i think adam is mentioning not using pla because pla is not strong enough it's not necessarily the uv capability about it right right it's less strong and it also um it also suffers a little bit you know in in high heat so it can yes. it can break down then yeah Considering you're literally using the heads of the screws, there's like a, a collar basically that the head of the screw fits into on the 3D print that's that's friction, not friction fitting, but you know, screw fitting it into place. You want that to be relatively rigid and things like PET G and ABS. ABS in particular is probably gonna be even better for you, but uh Jason Jenkins, no, for reasons that we already covered, PLA is you, you can't just clear coat your way to better PLA. Oh, I like that. Aha, I like that. Uh, no, you you need to use a better material. It's not going to be as brittle. PLA is very brittle. It, uh, PLA is pretty br brittle. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll bet you could build this out of PLA and it'd be fine, you know, for, for quite a while. But if you want, sure. the, ideally, PETG is, is going to be the, the better solution. 
That's that right. is a good point. If all you have is PLA and the thing that is going to make you either make this project or not make this project is the PLA piece, please just print just it in it. PLA and build it. You can always upgrade to PETG later because you'll have the pieces built. You can always just reassemble it. Yeah, so go nuts. I think we're just talking to like what the best solution would be. Uh, James Hannibal, last question. <laughs> Will right. Adam sell a fully built version of this antenna? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> there are I not. knew that. <laughs> <laughs> there are not enough hours in the day nope. uh and and uh i i like to to have a little bit of time to do some fun stuff myself and to try to keep uh you know some of my other yeah. products that i sell actually in stock sometimes literally <laughs> uh kd9 the uk asked the same question are you going to sell a ready-made version of this no you guys could go do this this isn't hard he's literally put it all together for you uh let's see i think that was uh pretty much it Adam, is there any uh, kits that we uh, your your standard antenna kits that we should expect to see uh, on Amazon? Should I should I pull that up? Is there possibly anything new? Yeah, so on uh, nothing new, but on K6ARK.com, there's a link to kits and parts, and um, the the QRP and 20 watt kits I think are all in stock currently. What? Um, really? Uh, the BNC mail is had some yeah the 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 i think all the qrp ones are in stock i'm not i think i'm not are. certain of that but qrp and 20 watt i think should all be in stock yeah well, i'm just gonna go ahead and see so oh, take this those are good to go and um, drop it in there there you go guys take that link to go get uh to go get all of adam's kits <laughs> Good job, oh man. That... And uh, SMA kits are in stock as well for for the True SDX. So if you if you want to oh, optimize yeah. True SDX antenna, that's that's an option too. I did uh, I did fix mine. So thanks for your help. The mic on that. kits are out of. Oh, yeah. they're gone. Good. D the, the mic kits are gone. They're gone. No, the the mic kits are out of stock currently. Okay. But um, I, I do plan to stock more. That's going to be next up, and then also hundred watt kits will be back in stock at some point when I have time. Um, the the microphone kits, worth noting, you just like this uh, antenna design, you can go on printables and find the, the build materials, the build instructions, and the STLs, and you can print your own and build your own, and you know it's, it's gonna be cheaper than the kit if you make like three of them. So, um, uh, you know, per, per unit, if you build three or more, you'll probably end up having a little cheaper than buying three kits. Yeah, excellent. Uh, your kits are completely reasonable. Again, I, I, I will point out it's like 20 bucks and you get a really nice usable uh, transformer for an NFED. You just add the wire and you're good to go. And it's it's not difficult. We did it live uh, on my uh, live stream. We, we built this live. Adam kind of walked me through it. But, but even that said, like his directions are good enough that I think you won't have any problem. I've built a number of these since then without any issue. And you can do them in a number of ways. You can make your own dipole. You can have a 49 to 1. You can have a 9 to 1 if you're so inclined. So, Adam, yeah, thanks again, man, for for joining us out here. Really appreciate you taking the time. And, and really, like, kind of creating a new project for the people that watch my channel. I mean, that's super nice of you to do that. And uh, really appreciate it. It's, it's my pleasure. I love doing it. And, um, you know, I, I obviously have fun coming up with and, and, and building and testing these designs and, and figuring out how to make them work. So yeah. um, I will, uh, you know, to mention the, the Discord after chat, I'll definitely be in on the Discord after chat and I'll be happy to answer uh, questions directly and, and even potentially talk about some of the other uh, antenna builds as well. So. You're, you're a consummate professional, Adam. That was going to be my next question is, will you be joining us for the after chat for a little while? So that's great news. I'm super excited about that. So I'm going to let Adam hop out here. He's going to go straight to the after chat. So if you didn't get your questions answered, eh, the best way to do that is join us on the Discord. The link is in the description. After you join, go to hashtag live dash stream. In there, there's going to be a text chat, and then there's going to be a voice chat. Adam will be on both, but voice chat is probably where you want to be if you have a question because we're going to want to know all your little info as well. So uh, I'm also going to be talking to AA0Z. Thanks, uh, Shooter Ready Standby. Uh, uh, right now, uh, Kyle is live. I'll pull up his YouTube in a second here to give him a shout out. Um, I am going to be doing my after chat uh, live stream. I'll still be on YouTube as well, but 
Kyle deserves a, a bit of love too. Go go maybe have both windows open. Uh, just mute him though, but you know, have it running in the background. I'm just kidding. Love you, Kyle. Uh, but they're doing ARRL sweepstakes. Normally, this is my favorite contest, and I should be participating in it. I'm just, I, I, I'll probably talk about it in the after chat. I'm a little, I'm a little upset with my QRM situation here at at home. But anyway, I'll let Adam hop off. Thank you again, Adam, uh, for taking the time to be on here, and uh, I will wrap up the show for everyone else. All right. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. See ya. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and pull up. The patrons, thank you so much, Patreon and everybody over there for supporting the channel. This was the Patron Picks episode. There's literally somebody just got sprayed with a skunk. I'm smelling skunk outside my window. I have my window cracked open, and I'm smelling skunk. That's horrible. Not a good smell. Not going to be a great after chat if that's the case. But that has nothing to do with the patrons. Thank you so much for the support. This episode was voted on by all these names here, our producer level patrons. They said, "Hey." Um, I want to talk about highly effective VHF, UHF Yaggies, something that you could backpack or carry with you. Because again, I know we mentioned soda and obviously I love soda. We all, we all love soda in theory. Not everybody necessarily goes out and, and does these big summits, right? Um, this is effective regardless of whether you take this to a summit or not. Just think of every time you have a handheld radio and you got a rubber duck antenna on. Even if you go buy a smiley half wave or a long ranger half wave antenna, this is going to do better than all of those, right? Because you're adding gain behind it. And that gain is also going to add in some side rejection, right? So it's going to be directional in the sense that you're going to be able to focus where you want to not only transmit to, but hear from. And that's going to have benefits across the board for you as an amateur radio operator. Particularly if you get really interested in uh, repeaters, you can build something like this, maybe not this one exactly, but you could build something like this. That Those aluminum elements are gonna last for a really long time. They're gonna be resistant to the weather and whatnot. And you'd be able to point it at you know a repeater that you talk on most often, and you'll be able to knock the doors down, be able to connect to that repeater without much problem, much better than you could with just your simple handheld antenna, right? Right. Uh, somebody said that it is the the devil's the devil's lettuce that they could be. Uh, that's what that smell is. It is not that. It is definitely a skunk. <laughs> I know the difference. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for everybody. Uh, what's the secret word? Oh, forgotten camera. The secret word is repeater. Repeater is the secret word. Yeah. So cheers to the patrons. Really do appreciate you guys and all the support you've given throughout the years. Uh, not just for my live streams, but also for my podcast. That's really what keeps a lot of that going, too. It's the only way I can keep Leia coming into the podcast studios because of the support we get over on Patreon. So thanks again. Uh, let's see. Pro tip. You can use ABC Hubba Bubba to hold this antenna. The, the, the uh, bubble gum? Well, you know that's not true. That's definitely not true. All right. Secret word time. Again, it is repeater. Repeater. I cannot tell you, I know people have put together better giveaway packages than me. Probably more high dollar ones, that's for sure. But James, James, you can smell it. That's not good. That's not good, man. But Yesu, FTDX10, ICOM705, Powerfilm Solar, at least one panel, and then a number of other stuff, likely, uh, definitely the Moby Link, but other things as well. And man it's because of you guys thank you for all the support really do appreciate it i'm gonna go wrap this up and i'm gonna hop over to the after chat i hope you join us and if you're not already hop over in the discord and start asking adam questions now don't wait for me go ahead ask your questions if you didn't get your question answered now's the time i'm josh ki6naz enjoy the memes 73 and take it easy get on the sweepstakes why not give it a shot try get that mug get that mug baby the thing that i will not get for another year. Add to the list of things that I'm not getting.